space. Okay, cool. Thanks for being here. Why should we be traveling to space? Um, gosh, that's the big question. Uh, because it's there, we can and we learn so much by doing it. Okay, so we, let's start with, well, it's there, it's obvious. We can, we can currently, and what was the third one? Um, and we'll learn so much by doing it. Okay, so, so what will we learn? <laughs> we, um, I mean, space is one of those things, it's, it is the, the next frontier. Star Trek say the final frontier, but actually there could be others, we never know. Um, and I grew up on science fiction and to me that was the very logical thing to do. But then you grow up and you realise that actually there are a lot of other influences on space exploration. There's the money and the politics and you have to answer the big question of why. Um, we in the UK pay into the European Space Agency, which means that we get to join other countries doing really big projects. And so we get to be a part of of exploring the solar system, but also doing um, uh, climate change missions, um, weather forecasting. Um, the fundamentals of how we live now are based on space. If all the satellites turned off, we would live very different lives. And we also can explore and do some of the big grand projects that you can't do on your own. And from those grand projects, we learn things that, that benefit us directly and, and indirectly. So space is really important. Okay, so you've touched on it, but where is space travel at? currently how do the next 10 15 20 years look what are the big projects on the horizon for the european space agency or, or um, um elsewhere so today we have people in orbit on the international space station and in fact there has been a constant human presence in space since the year 2000 so nearly 20 years there have been people over our heads uh, and that's often not really talked about but it's quite an achievement um, we have the, the means to get people there and back, and that's as far as we're going at the minute. There is a big grand plan to uh, build a space station in orbit around the moon, um, sometimes called the Deep Space Gateway, so that we can send people further away and then from there get down to the surface of the moon very easily and learn about living on another planet by living on the moon. Um, there is a, a plan of how to do that, but actually Donald Trump has accelerated things because he has said he wants people to be on the moon by 2024, and that's soon. Uh, so we, we could be back on the moon, but with a, a longer, more constant presence there. And, and to do it, it is an international effort. So the US will take a, a big lead, but actually they need international help to do that. What do we stand to gain here from having people on the moon? The, there are resources on the moon that we don't have on Earth, and so some of it could be mining things like helium-3. Um, some of it is, uh, is a political statement that we can do it. Some of it is actually just progressing human technology, learning how to live in that very extreme hostile environment. Uh, and the, the, the lessons that we learn and the technologies that we develop filter through into other parts of life. Um, there's two examples I love. I mean, people talk about the the spin-offs from the space program, and you always hear um, Velcro and Teflon, neither of which were actually invented by the space program. They were used extensively and popularized, but actually already existed. Um, but there are some things that were. Invisalign braces, that technology actually came from the space program. But in more importantly, um, SUIT uh, Biomedical Monitoring has created a system that monitors um, infants for sudden death syndrome um, and helps prevent it. And there's a planetary radar that is now being used to detect landmines uh, in a way that wasn't possible before. And so it's those advances that if we can harness and use on Earth will really benefit us. The counter argument is that the money that goes, these are, these are side products, these, you know, and that the money that goes into space could achieve that and X times more uh, if it were focused not on space, but on those, those sorts of areas. And we, would your argument be that, um, well, I mean, they would, we wouldn't be making these breakthroughs if it weren't for space travel, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so my argument would be um, the amount of money as well that we put into space is not nearly as much as everybody thinks. Um, the European Space Agency have done some analysis and they equated it to a cup of coffee from everybody across Europe. But when you compare it to those budgets that we're putting into health and education, it's really very small. And so the, the benefit you'd get by saying no more space, let's only focus on this, is not as big as you would like it to be. So, so we, we should explore space because, as you say, it makes you look outside your normal um, 
area of research. We, we wouldn't have invented these things if we had just funneled the money into health because they'd have been looking at something else. Um, but we can take the benefits that we've got from these technologies and use them for really important purposes. What does the uh, growth of private enterprises, private companies in space sector and space travel offer that wasn't being achieved by national or uh, international organisations? The rise of the commercial space companies is really exciting, I think. Um, we've got the sort of the big name, so Blue Origin, founded by Jeff Bezos uh, of Amazon, uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk. SpaceX is an interesting case because actually a lot of their funding is not commercial. It comes from NASA. They're part of the, the government's commercial program to build a vehicle to get people to the International Space Station. Um, but the way that they're doing it is a very commercial uh, method without lots of the oversight and the sort of government checks that the uh, sort of traditional NASA contracts have. Um, but what they're actually trying to do is, is space tourism and that and that will be something really different and that will be one of the sort of promises of science fiction so you can buy a ticket um at the minute it's about two uh two hundred thousand dollars um on virgin and, and you'll have seven minutes weightlessness and it's not very long but it's the first step so it'll take you on a, a suborbital hop but the advances of that would be we could get to space hotels and then the next step could be maybe we'll go to Australia in an hour rather than in 24. So it'll make the world a bit smaller and it will take us uh, to places people don't travel to yet. I mean, the benefit of space hotels is that, that people will get a view of the whole planet with no borders. And, and every astronaut who's come home has said that that's changed how they think of the world. So imagine if we could get politicians up and, and sort of warring nations and say, look, that's your little piece and that's everything else and how it fits. Um, that could be interesting. If a private company is successful in colonizing another planet, would its board form a government? Ooh, um, I don't think it's been planned for yet. Um, I don't think we have the rules and regulations for that. Um, the book, The Martian, and the movie sort of tried to answer it a little bit with, uh, well, they had some interesting things on space piracy. Um, the, at the minute, um, the only way you can get there is with governments. And there are government regulations on uh, how you should act when you're there. But no, would they own it? I mean, until somebody else came along and said they couldn't, they, I guess they'd be the only people with access to any minerals or any rights. So do you predict uh, conflict between government regulations and um, companies over colonization? We're seeing early signs of conflict in that all the countries have signed up to rules on planetary protection when it comes to Mars because um, the Mars rover that we're going to send next year is going to look for signs of life. Um, and so you, in order to do that, you can't take any life with you. And that's governed by an international treaty. Um, but somebody asked Elon Musk if he was going to um, adhere to the planetary protection rules. And he said, no, he didn't really believe in it. And once you send people, you'll have too much um, contamination anyway. Um, the US is a signature. So actually, it's the US government's responsibility for, uh, because he's a US owned company, to um, sort of monitor that um, and make the decision really as to whether they're going to stick to the treaty. Um, but when we start sending lots of people, I mean, things will definitely have to change and, and maybe they should, but we just means we have to do the science bit a lot faster, a lot sooner, um, because you might say what's more important sort of digging around for some microbes or sending people. Fair enough. Um, politically, domestically, and increasingly in different countries, uh, there's the feeling that Travel, along with many other industries, is a significant contributor, contributor to climate change, um, global warming. What do you make of the argument that we need more Greta Thunbergs and fewer Elon Musks? It's not really my area. Um, I think that space itself is a huge enabler for monitoring climate change and tracking. They have internationally, they've um, created the, um, the climate variables. Um, it's 50 different um, criteria that you have to measure to track the climate. And a significant proportion of those can only be measured from space. And many of them, you only get that global view from space. So if you want to see if people are actually doing what they say they're doing, reducing emissions and cutting down, you need the satellites. And so to get the satellites, you have to have the rockets. There is a push to make rockets greener 
Um, the very large rockets are actually fueled by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, and it turns into water. So um, you know, some parts of the industry are already very green. Uh, satellites run on solar power. Um, and, and so it's sort of, you could say they're renewable. Um, and yes, as every other industry, we need to make sure that, that we also do our bit to, to, to be as climate conscious as possible because it's, it's critical. Um, but space is the one area where we really need to make the advances because that's how we're going to, to track everything and make sure that our, our planet, I mean, it's how we know we have a problem and it's how we know we'll have solved it. Yeah, and I guess once stuff is there, it's informative, it's helping, and it's not contributing in any way. It's just getting it there. Yeah. That's, the, that's the thing to crack. And, and even that, it isn't that bad. We, proportionally, the effect of a rocket um, compared to all of the global air travel is tiny. So there are many other problems that we should fix um, to actually solve the issue. And, but, um, but even so, we're, we are working on it. OK, so it's, it's the moon by 2024, which will definitely happen. We, maybe not. Uh, when will we colonize Mars? When will, when will humans reach Mars? Uh, when will humans reach Mars? Elon Musk has said he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. Um, and uh, so he's got the rest of his lifetime, what, another sort of 30, 40 years maybe? Um, there is a plan to, to sort of go on to Mars after the moon. So the international uh, sort of global um there's a global committee on exploration and, and they would like to get people to mars it is the next place to send people to um but we have to learn all of the lessons on how to do that on the moon and in a sustainable way sort of the apollo mission was a big enormous program but it was very much driven by the aim is to land on the moon and it and it took a lot of money and resources because it was a race and so they had to do it fast. Whereas now we're looking at how do we do it sustainably and to take benefit of, of everything when we get there and then go on to Mars. So, so as to when, um, we're approaching 2020, so in the 2030s, 2040s. And when will commercial space travel be, uh, well, I would say affordable, but maybe more affordable? The model for space travel is very interesting. It, they're taking people um, who are huge enthusiasts and can afford it and then getting them to fund all the initial stages so that the price can then come down. A little bit like air travel was in the early days. You know, you, you, had, to, you had to be wealthy to be able to afford it. Um, Virgin Galactic uh, have, have said next year. They've said next year for, for several years. So, uh, but, but their next year is getting closer and closer. Um, and so they are nearly there. So. I, I, it's always very hard to predict, um, especially because sort of human safety is on the line. And so nobody wants to rush anything because it has to be safe. And that is the first option. It's not, you don't have to be first, you have to be careful. Um, but if they do get up next year with the sort of the early flights uh, and the, the sort of founder members and the, um, the initial pioneers, so then now it's 2020 and and it's successful and carries on then maybe by the end of the decade it'll be an affordable activity for lots of us and would you go yes i would definitely go fulfilling the science fiction childhood aspiration absolutely i mean i was a teenager when star trek the next generation came out and i was going to be on a starship one day <laughs> it's going to take a while i think but you never know i hope you may <laughs> brilliant okay for more debates talks and interviews subscribe today to the institute of art and ideas at IAI TV.